Good morning and welcome to Lakeview. Let's all, let's all stand and, and we'll pray here quick first. Lord, we thank you so much for your presence here among us. As your body gathers together, we pray, Lord, that you would um, fill this place with your presence and your spirit. Lord, may we uh, engage with our whole hearts in worshiping you. And may you be pleased and blessed by our worship as we're here together with you. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Well, it's good to be in the house of the Lord, especially for me. Watch it from um, online the last couple of weeks. I want to say hi to everybody watching us online and uh, really thank everybody that has put that together so we can watch that at home and all the sound booth guys and everybody that work hard to get that to be online. That, even to go back and watch some of that is a privilege and an honor. So just want to say hi to everybody there and if you're uh, visiting with us, we want to welcome you and thank you for coming out to Lakeview. We'd love to have you uh, uh, fill out a communication card and put it in a uh, box in the back, um, offering box in the back, and put any praises or uh, prayers that you would want to get, let help us to share and pray for you. It's a privilege to do that. Plus, um, welcome you. We'd love to put a guest pack in your hand, let you learn a little bit more about Lakeview Chapel and how we love to share the gospel of Christ and the love of Christ in our community and around. So we'd love to get you one of them. We're even looking at um, doing something that, like if you're at home and would like that, just try to get a hold of us or even call the office and we'll try to get that uh, for you at home. I don't want to let it go by without uh, talking about what a beautiful day yesterday, wasn't it? <laughs> All summer long I was trying to wait to get out of the 90s so I could uh, not sweat to death, but yesterday was just gorgeous. In the morning you realize 
People don't say you see God, but when you looked around yesterday and saw all the colors, saw that beautiful sunshine, and just the chance to get outside was just beautiful. And I, I just give him all the glory and honor and thanks. I'd like to take you right into the announcements, right inside the front page of your uh, bulletin. Um, Operation Christmas Trial. Uh, we got a lot of things back there. There's uh, things you can bring in. That's coming fast, believe it or not. It's hard to believe we got an election coming right up here. We got November 16th through the 23rd will be the shoebox collection. And it's just amazing what we can still reach out and do for the kids out there. And that's just been a blessing. So lift that up in prayer. Also, don't forget about Angel Tree. This is something you can get a hold of Holly with. This is something that means a lot even in our community to get uh, gifts for the kids for people that are incarcerated. And that's something to... It's just something when we have the tree up and you grab that card and go get a gift, what a blessing that is. So keep that in mind, lift that up in praise, prayer. And plus, um, raise the roof fund. Don't forget about that. We got a couple things out here that we found, uh, water not going in the right places and stuff like that we got to have fixed. And um, we'd like to finish that up before winter hits. So we thank you for that. And uh, a couple other things. Uh, I want to do the Red Cross. That'll be coming at the end of the month. And there's been a huge drive lately about um, giving blood. And I can confess that I have not always been good about giving blood. I think back when I first go to church, there was something about the power of the blood, you know, maybe you shouldn't share. But after having a sick son that needed so much plasma and so many transfusions, um, it was a pleasure for Wendy and I to get to give blood for the first time right here at Lakeview Chapel. And and it was actually very blessing and rewarding to know that we could do that and give all the glory and honor to God. So seeing us out there helping the community is just something I just want to put out there and just thank the Lord um, for different things. I, I never realized that somebody sits there for two hours, they pump their blood out and take their plasma. And Patty is one of them that can do that because she makes so much plasma in her body. And you start learning different things that are just amazing. Well, until your son is sitting there and needs all that plasma, you don't realize it. And it's, um, it's something that I'll be thankful for, you know, until heaven. And we probably won't understand it until heaven, so I'm sorry, a little teary-eyed. But it's just a blessing that there's people out there willing to wait for two hours. Give them blood will only take you about 20 minutes. But um, the plasma is just something I learned and I just wanted to share. It was just powerful. And... Um, I thank you for that. Let's all rise and give all the glory and honor and praise to our Lord Jesus Christ. The song Living Hope reminds us of our desperate lostness before we knew Christ. And it celebrates how Jesus died uh, not only to save us, but he rose again in victory. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free.
kids engaged. We've missed them. They're not here. We can't have them downstairs. But there is a way that we can pull them in and tie them in. And if they start coming or if they see us on the internet because their folks are watching, um, we have a new game. Was that? Oh, I thought it was thunder. I was like, hmm. Um, in the back, we have clipboards. They're boring. I know. However, what's on them well, they're not colorful. They're not star-spangled or, you know, have dancing bears on them or anything like that. Jeff's up here laughing at me. Um, we've had them back there for a while, and, and what they have are goals for the kids so that they can become one with us, learning about God as we talk about God and hear the word. So this front page is church notes, okay? And that's important because it ties in everything that's being discussed who is singing, what do we learn about. We decided we're going to try a different little thing to add on to that. So, today, there's a maze. It's kind of easy, which is good, because, you know, mazes can be complicated. We also have the verses here. Now, these are for kids that are, you know, kindergarten on up. There are different levels that we're using. Um, you can fill in the verses. The verses are there so the kids can look in the Bible. They can pick out the word, write, the, write it in. And then um, we have a word find for those people that need a little bit more focus and concentration. Every week these are going to be different, but they are all going to tie into what is being talked about. It's going to relate back to the message so that the kids are involved with us. If they try try and work on some of this while they're in church, they'll get a prize in the very back. Every week the prize is going to be different. Now, I was just trying to do the word find that I created back there. It's hard. Okay? I mean, I still haven't found all of them, and I'm the one who created it. So, even if the kids find a couple of the words, again, it ties into the message. So they don't have to have a complete form here. All they need to do is have a date and a name on there. So I know that I've given out five clipboards so far. I would love to see a bunch of kids come and get 
something, a surprise at the end. We'll see how that goes. And if for some reason you're not able to join us, but you would like these, they will still be here. And even if it was from last week or next week, if you bring them in, you will still get a prize for completing them, okay? So I think that's all I have. I, th I have to look at my notes. When I, when I diverge off my notes, I forget things. Yes, Art, Art's gonna be in, thank you Art for volunteer, being voluntold or volunteering, I'm not quite sure which it was. He was volunteered before he was voluntold, let's put it that way. He's got the prizes for this week, and then I also have some juice boxes in the back. And if some of you more seasoned adults would like a crossword puzzle or, or a really difficult word find, I have extra copies for you to take home. You'll take one? Very good. I got another one in. Okay, so thanks, you guys, and uh, we'll be seeing you week after week. And if Art's not here, we'll volunteer told somebody else to sit in the back with the prizes, okay? Um, if for some reason we get more and more kids and it's getting too jumbled and there's too much activity, we've been thinking about putting a table in the back and having one of us more <clears throat> senior people in there to help guide and assist um, the kids. But we haven't gotten that far yet. We want to see how this is going to work. So please encourage your kids to take part. We want to see them here. We want them to feel welcome here and... Um, there, that's as long-winded as I can be for this morning. I'll let the next person be long-winded. There we go. Thanks, Jeff. I was just saying when she said board, that it's clipboard. Board. Oh, okay, never mind. You guys didn't pick up on that. <laughs> Got to have a heart like a child, it says. So I want to read that. He goes, and it really leads into that. I really think if you don't realize the heart behind Patty and Kelly and Holly and Brenda and Marissa and uh, Chrissy and Sandy and Jen and Courtney and the pastor and Charles and Steve and Stu even, just reaching out to our kids. This is an important time. I mean, we need to pray. Left somebody out. I'm looking at her. She's smiling, Janet, so sorry about that. You always you got to worry about names all the time. And I think even with my wife being a bus driver and the school teachers and everything else and the kids sitting at home that want to go to school or can't go to school. This is such a tough time. So I just want to lift up a, just a prayer to the Lord. We need you, Lord. Help us on this one. And um, I just thank Kelly for doing that. And uh, I get to be Mr. Jeff today. So I get to do their role. And I actually volunteered for it. And um and I had a couple of verses I wanted to read to just set the stage. It says, Matthew 18, 3, it says, Truly, I tell you, unless you change and become like a little child, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. So I was thinking about that. So I got to, you know, get me in that thinking mode, right? So I'm going to put my thinking cap on. All right. Get the good old thinking cap on. Get me thinking like the little kids. Hope I don't dribble this. Uh, let me take a shot at it. I can keep going. Mike knows I can keep going. But it is truly to have a heart like a child. Sometimes when you let go and just trust like a little child. Matthew nineteen fourteen, he says, Jesus said, Let the children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. And even goes on, this will fit later on, even before that, when he says, the people brought little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them and pray for them. So as we're talking to everybody at home and stuff like that, we look at it and I thought about as a young kid what it thinks about, you know, what I think I was a young kid at one time, but um, thinks about, that's not a word, I try not to do my grammar, but um. It's amazing how you got to keep your head straight so you don't lose your cap. But I had to write this one down, you know, because in this day and age, we hear so many people say, where's God? In John 3.8, I talk about the air we breathe. It's a John 3.8 says, wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sounds, but you can't tell where it came from or where it's going. It's a lot like being born of the Spirit, being born of God. 
And as I thought through those things, there's seven things that the people that have come up and talk to our kids and really want to have a heart for our kids. There's seven things. I'm going to run down through them because I don't want to take too long. It says, God is holy. He is. He's perfect in every way. You know, and everybody will say, well, what's going on out there? But God is holy. In 1 Peter 1.16, it says, for it is written, be holy because I am holy. Number two, we are imperfect. You're looking... Um, we fall short of his commands. I even wrote the 10 by that, the 10 commandments. It says Romans 3.23, for all, all of us, have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And Jesus took our punishment for us. Number three, our sins. He loves us, though. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us. And when I think about that, and I think about what I read to you, piece of paper there's so many things it says the rocks will even cry out if we don't praise the lord but sometimes even knowing about a piece of paper um if i turn to jay i go jay if i gave you this piece of paper with no pen or anything how would you describe god It'd be a little hard wouldn't it so today i go what color would you like jay It's all folded up. Nothing special about it. I'm going to have Jay hold it. Now, the thing is, if you choose to follow Christ, you've got to make a decision, don't you? Every day, pretty much. It doesn't, you do it once, but every day we make the choice to follow Christ, our Lord and Savior. And Jay, you've been great lately, so I'm going to cut this right down to half. Just like every day when we play, are we going to listen to Mom? Are we going to listen to Dad? Are we going to do this? I'll unfold everything and then show them again. Even by this piece of paper, it'll show that God is always with us. God is among us. It's a cross and that he died for us as we just read. And how <laughs> I thoroughly enjoy how Patty comes up here and shows different demonstration. But this one shows us, us every day. We have to make a choice. Even the little guys to choose what it's like to be obedient to mom and dad. Even like us, to be obedient to Christ. And come to him and realize that our sins are taken away. And you know, and the other thing is, is a mom and dad, I don't know if you could tell, I was a very high energy kid. What that, ADD or whatever, I guess. Back then we did not initial, they just said, but my mom, you know what? Mom and dads, keep telling your kids how special they are. And how God has a plan for them. They are. And they truly are. Thank you, Jay. You can go. So number four was God offers his Holy Spirit. This is a tough one. Because we just talked about being born in the Spirit. And where does the wind come from? And people challenge it. And it says, Ephesians 1.13 says, The message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, when you believe you were marked, in him with a seal, the Holy Spirit. Teach that to your young ones, that they have the Holy Spirit there all the time. God's with them at all the time. God, God offers us forgiveness and eternal life. Like it says in John 10, 28, I give eternal life and they shall never perish. We'll be with him in heaven forever. And then praying. Take the time to pray with a child. Tell them how special they are. But even it doesn't even have to be a big one. Sometimes it's, dear Lord, help us. <laughs> that might be the best prayer I've ever said in my life. Dear Lord, help us. God has a plan, and it's a special plan for each one of them. And then the last thing, praise God for what he has done. Share what he has done for you. And I don't know, if you've ever seen a little one on fire or just want to talk about God, they, you can't hold them back. And they're so excited. And um, I just want to thank 
the kids, and I just want to say everybody, even at home, um, as Kelly has just brought up, we want to share the gospel with you, and we still want to be a part of your lives, and we thank you for all that. And we'll just say that in Jesus' name. Amen. There's uh, one announcement in the bulletin just inside that there's a virtual alliance event at near the end of the month. Not all, we don't have all the details yet, but something that you can go to um, a virtual event online um, on October 23rd. They're going to include uh, a video never before seen of the alliance going into a valley in Indonesia and uh, reports from international workers and inspiring messages there. So that's something to watch for also. Um, okay. I wanted to read Psalm 138. Psalm 138. If you want to turn there and follow along, um, Psalm 138. This was awake earlier today. <laughs> I'm starting here. Okay, here we go. Psalm 138. I will praise you, Lord, with all my heart. Before the gods, I will sing your praise. I will bow down towards your holy temple, and I will praise your name for your unfailing love in your faithfulness, for you have, ex you have so exalted your solemn decree that it surpasses your fame. When I called, you answered me. You greatly emboldened me. May all the kings of the earth praise you, Lord, when they hear what you have decreed. May they sing of the ways of the Lord, for the glory of the Lord is great. Though the Lord is exalted, he looks kindly on the lowly. Though lofty, he sees them from afar. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve my life. You stretch out your hand against the anger of my foes. With your right hand, you save me. The Lord will vindicate me. Your love, Lord, endures forever. Do not abandon the work of your hands. Let's pray. King of kings, Lord of lords, creator Father of all, you're glorious in majesty and beautiful in your holiness and righteousness. You're abundant in grace and mercy. You're the giver of all good gifts and the only Savior of all the people. We humble ourselves before you. Lord, we pray that you would forgive us our sins as we confess them now to you. Lord, we're grateful that you are faithful to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Lord, we want to thank you and praise you that Pastor Dave, Brenda, and Alex, we're able to have been here for about a year that Dave and Brenda are on vacation with their family. Thank you for them. Lord, I pray that you would remind us during this Pastor Appreciation Month to make a special effort to remind them of what they mean to us to show our appreciation to them. We thank you that there are many ladies on the women's retreat this weekend. They'll be traveling back soon. We pray, Lord, that they would find that abundant joy in living in you and your amazing grace. We thank you, Lord, that Dave's heart procedure went well and that he's here with us today. We thank you, Lord, that Jeff's shingles are getting better. We pray for continued healing and for him and Wendy. We thank you for Renee's report about the bungalow hospital staff and the family that had COVID and that they've, been, they've all recovered. 
We thank you that President Trump and the First Lady are recovering from COVID. We pray for the staff that they would continue to recover. We thank you, Lord, for protecting us at Lakeview. Lord, bind us together in unity that the world might know that you love them and have sent your son, Jesus. Amen. So I, the, the big picture that I've been sort of playing back in my mind for a while now, for a couple of years, um, the overarching message of God's plan for us as believers, sometimes that looks a little different than the churchianity that we may have grown up in. Sometimes we, I grew up in a church, went to church my whole life um, as a kid, and the things that I saw on Sunday, the things that we were talking about in church weren't always necessarily the things that were being revealed in my home. And that caused a big conflict in my heart because what God's word says is what people in my life said they believed. But when it got down to it, outside of church, that's not what they were, that's not how they were acting. That's not what I was seeing. And maybe you've even experienced that yourself. Maybe um, family or friends who are believers in Christ, who, who uh, claim, claim that they follow him. In church, they look one way. Out of church, they look a different way. So the overarching message of God's plan, originally starting at creation, going back to that, Adam and Eve in the garden, God is with them. He's, um, he, he's in close relation with them. They can, they can participate together in community. Eve is deceived. Adam and Eve are deceived by, by Satan, the enemy into um, rebelling against God and therefore all of us are descendants uh, through Eve and have this sin nature that is born in our, in our lives. We can't do anything about that. So God establishes these covenants all throughout the Old Testament through, with different people. He has Noah and Abraham and Moses and David and along those Along that his history, he empowers people by his spirit for a purpose. If you fast forward to Jesus, his birth, the spirit is united with Mary to give birth to, to Jesus, bring him life. Jesus is baptized by John the Baptist. We see a uh, the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, descending upon Jesus at his baptism as he's filled with the Holy Spirit. And his ministry on earth begins. He's taken into the wilderness, he's tested and tried, and his ministry begins. Jesus heads to the cross, taking on the sin of the world that we were born with through Eve, at that, that original sin, the fall of, of mankind. And he does that to provide a way to be reconciled, for us to be reconciled with God for eternity as he was originally established in the garden. The Holy Spirit then resurrects Jesus from death, resurrects him from, from the grave. Jesus ascends to the Father in heaven and empowers his, his disciples with that spirit that we might walk victorious, bringing glory to God in our relationships with him and with others. Now that's kind of like a high level 30,000, maybe even 100,000 foot view of sort of what's happened so far and where we are in that, in that timeline. But there's also parts of this that are um, maybe a little bit less clear. There's an enemy, we have an enemy whose desire is to destroy those very things, those goals that God has for our lives, for those relationships in our lives, our relationship with him, our relationship with others, 
the relationship that we have with one another here in this church. These are goals of, of Satan. That's one, one aspect. The other one is our own flesh. Our own flesh nature is in conflict with the spirit of God. Galatians talks about the flesh and the spirit being in conflict with one another. So if you're a Jesus follower, or maybe you're still trying to understand uh, God's role, Jesus' role, the Holy Spirit's role, and your role in this life, I would like to review um, several verses this morning and remind us of new life in Christ. First one is in Romans 10, 9, and 10. It says, If you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it's with your heart that you believe and are justified, it's with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. So belief, belief in your heart, profession of faith with your mouth, leads to salvation. Do you believe it? Can you believe it? In your heart? Amen. 2 Corinthians 5.17 Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. It speaks to the person we once were. The new person we've become through Christ, in Christ. Romans 6, 1 through 11. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may, have, may live a new life. For if we have been united with him in death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin may be done away with that we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Skip down to 11. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin but alive to God in Christ Jesus. If you're here and you're breathing and you're a believer in Christ and you say that you have professed, professed your faith in, in him, you believe it in your heart, you profess that he is He's overcome death. You are not a slave to sin. You're not a slave to this world. You can live as free men and women. And if we're free men and women, and we know that we once were a slave, how good is it to share that news with others who are in slavery? There was a passage from a book that I was reading, and I can't remember if I shared it here or not, but talked about at the turn of, well, around the Emancipation Proclamation, when slaves were set free. What do you think the masters who owned slaves wanted to do to those slaves? Did they want them to know that they were free and, and ready to leave? You know, go ahead, slaves. Go on your very your merry way. You know, you're free now. No, they don't. They, that was not something that's, that slave owners would want to do. And slaves themselves, if they don't know they're free, they can't walk in freedom. We are not slaves to sin. We are not slaves to this world. We can walk in freedom. It's a choice. Romans 8, 1 through 17. Actually, I'm going to pick out parts of that because it's kind of long. The law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. Verse 
verse 5, those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the spirit have their minds set on what the spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but in the realm of the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. Verse 11, and if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of the spirit who lives in you. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if you live by the spirit, you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Verse 16, the spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we might also share in his glory. We've been set free to live by the spirit, to receive peace, to receive life. God created us as his handiwork. Ephesians 2.10, we, we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do the good works which God prepared for us in advance to do. God's given us everything we need to live a godly life. 2 Peter 1.3-9. He's given us everything we need to live a godly life. Allowing us to participate in his divine nature, living free from the corruption of the world caused by evil desires. Interestingly, in James, in, in the book of James, chapter 114, it talks about each one being tempted when we're lured and enticed by our own evil desires. Tempted by our own desires. Ephesians 4, 17 to 32. So I tell you this and insist on it that the Lord, in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. They're darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. I believe that's written as an instruction and a warning to us as well. Having lost all sensitivity, they've given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity, and they are full of greed. That, however, is not the way of life you learned when you heard about Christ and were taught in him accord in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self. You may recall um, Colossians 3, we talked... Dave, Pastor Dave talked about this, uh, putting, putting the old ways to death. That's a little stronger. Put it to death. Put to death the old ways, the old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires. To be made new in the attitude of your minds, to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor. For we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. In other words, quickly forgive an offense. So that the anger in the moment doesn't turn into bitterness in your heart. Verse 29, don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what 
but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it might benefit those who listen. How often do you find yourself tearing down others with words? Whether directly, speaking directly to them, or indirectly, speaking about them. God's word is challenging. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. Jeff called that one out before Ephesians 1.13. Sealed, marked for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to each other, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. As I ask these questions to you, I ask them of myself. How are you doing in this area? Recall Luke 23, Jesus on the cross. Beaten, scourged, incorrectly charged, and near death, and he asks his Father in heaven, to forgive them because they didn't know what they were doing. Can we extend that kind of forgiveness to people in our lives? Can we forgive, can we extend that kind of mercy to people in our lives? I believe the answer is absolutely yes. If the spirit of Christ dwells in us and is transforming our hearts. Some other thoughts I had as I was taking notes on this this section. How's your thought life? What are the motivations of your heart? We read in Hebrews that the word of God is active and alive and separates. Hebrews 4. Four twelve. For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. How are we doing with that? How are we doing letting the word of God challenge? Challenge and judge the thoughts and attitudes of our heart. First John 3, 1 through 3. See what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called the children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we had, what will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. All who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. How are we purifying ourselves? Again, these questions are for me. I hope, I hope they resonate for you too. 1 Corinthians 1.57 says, But thanks be to God, he gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. He does the work, we just have to be willing. 1 Corinthians 2, 11 through 16. For who knows a person's thoughts except their own spirit within them? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. What we have received is not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, 
so that we may understand what God has freely given us. This is what we speak, not in words taught to us by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit, explaining spiritual realities with Spirit-taught words. A person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, but considers them foolishness and cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the Spirit. The person with the Spirit makes judgments about all things, but such a person is not subject to merely human judgments. The Holy Spirit instructs us in the deep things of God. And the Holy Spirit extends beyond just, this isn't an adult Holy Spirit. We were um, going through some material, I think it really resonated quite a bit, that Rob Reimer in uh, his, his book, Material Soul Care, talked about how his, his daughter, child, um, had witnessed some, some transformation, some miraculous power of God working through her dad. And she, asked, she said, Dad, can you teach me how to do that? Can, can you teach me, you know, teach, teach me how to... Um, set people free and he responded said something like there's no junior Holy Spirit you get the full deal and how much easier as a child is it to trust can't overlook those things So we have been born with a spirit. We, we have been, we've received the spirit of God when we came into relationship with him through Christ to live free. But again, there are some strategies of an enemy. I'll use the term Satan, Satan, I'm Satan broadly here, but meaning Satan or his army, uh, the devil. Ephesians 6 describes our spiritual battle and our spiritual defense. 6.12 says, "For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. This one challenged me a lot in the past couple of years. Can you let that sink in? Enemies are not people. We are not... We, you're not enemies with people. You're, you're an, you have an enemy in a heavenly realm which is a, a spiritual force of evil. Do you believe that? If you don't believe that, ask the Holy Spirit to reveal it to you. Reveal the truth of that passage and maybe your revelation will be different than mine. But that one verse has rocked my thinking quite a bit because if I believe that, it changes how I see the world in almost every interaction, in almost every relationship that I have. With the relationships that I have with people that I know and especially with the relationships with people I don't know. When we look around in the world, we see division everywhere. When we look at the election, we see division everywhere. When you look at the media, you see division. When you look at Facebook, you see division. And we can look at that and start really thinking that that is people with this other opinion that's so different from mine that I could, you know, they're my enemy. They're not your enemy. God created all men, all women in his image. And he loves all of them equally. But one of Satan's strategies is deception. If we think back to the original sin, Genesis 3, Adam and Eve deceived by Satan in the garden. He uses a little bit of truth. He uses a little bit of deception. They trusted their feelings that the fruit looked good for eating and was pleasing to the eye. It was desirable for wisdom, and they took a bite. 
John in, in chapter 8, 44 says Satan's character, it describes Satan's character as a liar. He's the father of lies. His intent is to confuse your mind, confuse it into ignorance of God's will, confuse your mind in, about your position as a redeemed, redeemed saint through Christ. And our weapon is to, def to defend ourselves is the knowledge of truth. Gird yourself with the knowledge of truth, truth of what God says about you. But you are a chosen people. You are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession to proclaim the virtues of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. 1 Peter 2.9 says, chosen in him before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless. Sorry, this is Ephesians 1.4. Chosen in him to be before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless in his presence. Another strategy is accusation. We read in Revelation 12 as John is, John receives this revelation of heaven. Describes Satan as the accuser of the brethren accusing us of our sins before God day and night. If you recall in the book of Job, Satan brought accusations before God regarding Job, claiming that Job only loved and feared God because of the many blessings that he was given. But he was proven wrong when Job turned from God, when Job didn't turn from God and when everything was stripped away in his life. Praise God, the new covenant, we have defense in Jesus. Jesus is our defense. He's our advocate. He's our atoning sacrifice. And he's seated at the right hand of God, interceding for us at all times on our behalf. Do you believe that? Satan is also a destroyer. 1 Peter 5, 8, and 9 describes the enemy as a roaring lion prowling around to look for someone to devour. Devin and I used to watch uh, this show called Big Cat Diary where they followed um, big game, big, big, big cats in uh, the Sahara Desert and they watched them hunt and stuff like that. When lions hunt, who do they pick? They usually choose their victims based on the physical condition of the small animal, either weak, slow. Those are usually at the top of the menu. I'd ask you to engage with the Holy Spirit and ask him to show you what a weak and slow Christian looks like. What does that mean in our life? Am I weak and slow? Should it be? If you've truly come to the Father through Jesus, his Son, the living Spirit of God is alive within you. No enemy is too powerful for Christ. But we have to take every thought that comes to our mind captive. 2 Corinthians 10.5 to demolish every argument and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. We take cap captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. I was sharing with Pastor Dave, sometimes I can really recognize these, these flaming arrows is as described as we, as we read through Ephesians 6 in the army of God, the flaming arrows of Satan. They're sometimes very obvious in my life when the thoughts that I have about people are not of God. And when you can recognize that, bring it before God in that moment. When you recognize the thoughts of people, relationships, relationships with others. He put us here together. 
if our relationships are not healthy, if our relationships with others aren't healthy, our relationships with God cannot be healthy. Jesus, in his high priestly prayer in John 17, prays for us. He prays for his disciples at the time. He prays for all believers, which includes you and me, which is pretty bizarre when you think about it, that Jesus prayed for us, interceded for us, even back 2,000 years ago. Prior to the crucifixion, he prays this intercessory prayer for his disciples and then for you and I, for those who believe in him. through the message of the disciples. He prays in, verse, in chapter 17 of John, verse 20 uh, through the end. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, their message meaning the disciples' message, sharing the gospel, that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, May they also be in us so that the world may believe you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. You know, pause for a second. Think about this for one second. The world will see by our unity and our love for each other that that's not normal. That's not worldly. That's not fleshly. There's something different about that. And they'll know that the love of God exists through his son who they can come to, to be reconciled to him once again. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me, because you have loved me before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you, and they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. His prayer for you and I, brothers and sisters in Christ, is that we would be unified as one so that those who do not know him would believe that God sent him And he loves them so much that he sent his son for them. How are we doing? How are your relationships with other members of the church? Are we revealing God's love to the world? some of the questions that I had for myself to reflect on um, as I went through all these things is one, do I believe that I'm an enemy of Satan? Do I understand that? Do I understand there's a, there's a battle, a spiritual battle war that's waging? Two, have I been involved in struggles or conflicts with my brothers and sisters in Christ that are still unresolved? That's an important question to ask yourself sometimes. Is there still unresolved conflict? Do I need to work on the resolution before I can bring my praises to the altar? Have I given the enemy a foothold by allowing anger to turn into bitterness in my heart? Do I believe that Jesus is the supplier of healing and can heal my heart? Do I believe there's power in the name of Jesus? Have I been honest with my brothers and sisters in Christ? 
Do I believe that I live for God? Do I believe in the power of prayer? Do I recognize my role in the kingdom of God? There's something about understanding our position in Christ, understanding the, the world that we live in and its schemes and desires and the flesh that we were born into, the schemes of Satan, and then Jesus' plan for unity, his desire for us to love unconditionally the way he does, doesn't always look like that's getting played out and it doesn't always look like that's getting played out in the church we need to search our hearts allow the Holy Spirit to do some work in our hearts to convict us to reveal these things to us so that we can do the very thing that Jesus prayed for we can be empowered by his spirit so that all men and women may know who he is who, and, and that God loves him and sent him Lord, thank you for your love for us. Thank you for providing your son, Jesus. Thank you for making him known to us that we can experience fullness, freedom in our hearts. God, I pray that you would give us Hearts that are humble. Teach us, Holy Spirit, in truth that we can recognize the traps of this world traps of our own flesh and the schemes of the devil to overcome by your power thank you Lord for the truth of your word thank you for the people of this church God give us a commitment to unity You're good. You're a good father. And we love you. And teach us to love you even more. Increase our faith. Thank you that you made a way for us to come back to the Father. Thank you for bringing us here today. We have so much to be grateful for, Lord. Thank you for transforming our hearts. Continue to do that as we seek to walk in your ways. And we will give you all the praise and glory. In your name we pray. Amen. Let's all stand. Father, for still working among us, healing, healing broken hearts and bodies, turning lives around, because that's who you are.
Lord, we look forward to that day. There will be healing, no more sickness, sorrow, division. All those things that the enemy tries to attack us with in our relationships with one another. And Lord, we look forward to that. But while we're waiting, Lord, help us to be faithful. Help us to understand what you've made us, who you've made us. How you've made us for more than just a rescue for heaven. You've made us to be a part of that rescue of others. Lord, may we be, may we be faithful in, in uh, putting into practice what we learn and say in words while we're here in this building to do it in our lives, in our homes, at work, with our friends and family, our neighbors. Lord, we pray that you would bless us as we go to be your light in this world and that you would be glorified in it all. Bless this in Jesus' name. Amen.